you are episode 131, The Challenges of Digital Marketing at a Large Corporation. DigitalMarketingRadio.com Today's episode is brought to you by Aweber. Build your email list, engage your subscribers, do email the right way. I've arranged a special deal for all digital marketing radio listeners, and that's a 60-day free trial with the email marketing software provider I use, Aweber. Lock in your 60-day free trial, plus view a video that I've recorded on the three reasons why I use their service at aweber.com slash DMR. So just go to aweber.com slash DMR to get started today. The Big Interview with David Bain. I'm David Bain, and this is Digital Marketing Radio, weekly interviews with online marketing gurus. Catch up with all the previous episodes at digitalmarketingradio.com. I'm joined today by someone who leads the PPC and SEO efforts for a large multinational corporation. He's Director of SEO and Digital Marketing at Pearson Education. Welcome to DMR, Jarrett Byram. Hey, thanks you for having me, David. Well, great. Yeah, fan, thanks for um, uh, joining me, Jarrett. Um, great to have you here. Well, you can find Jarrett, of course, over at Pearson.com. Um, so, Jarrett, I see that you also run websites for small businesses. So, is it better to have a small budget and be able to make decisions quickly or have a larger budget and have to spend more time justifying why you want to do things? Well, nothing trumps budget at the end of the day. So it's always better to have a large budget. And, you know, if you take time and you really want to take time when you're spending a large budget, you know, you don't want to spend millions of dollars and then, you know, think about it later. So, but at, there's also a big advantage for small businesses and especially those small to medium sized businesses that compete with large businesses. Cause you do have, like you can turn on a dime, right? Which most large businesses can't. So, I mean, obviously a small business can't compete with a large corporation, but if you're in that mi- middle size, like a medium sized business and you're going after, you say one customer that a large business is also still going after the fact that you are a lot more mobile and nimble. Like what you can do is an actual, a pretty big advantage. So can you see bigger companies becoming more nimble in the future? Or do you think it's always going to be advantageous for smaller businesses being able to be more nimble? Well, big businesses are coming more nimble. I don't think they'll ever get to the nimbility of like a really small business that may have one decision maker. Um, But if you really think about it, if you look at all the reorgs, the layoffs and things that all these large businesses are doing, I mean, a big part of that is the new kind of economy we live in and like kind of, you know, the old dinosaurs being replaced with your younger. Um, yeah. Well, can you be older and uh, not be a dinosaur? <laughs> is it to do with age or just mindset? No, I think it's mindset. And um, that's why all these companies are going through reorgs or changing from that old mindset to that new mindset. And I mean, if you follow investing at all, like, you know, that almost every day, like, another company announces that they're going through a major reorg or usually you hear about it in the form of layoffs right yeah absolutely um so i'm conscious of the fact that obviously you work for an organization that's got about forty thousand employees i i I gather um so what are the challenges that you face you know heading up the digital marketing department in such a large organization well i think one of the challenges right there is i actually don't head up all of digital marketing i'm really two areas like SEO and digital advertising and digital advertising is really um, PPC. Like I just kind of feel like the term PPC doesn't really fit it as much anymore because it's not as much pay-per-click. There's a lot of more CPM, like remarketing and stuff and, you know, content tools. Like there's all sorts of things that you're doing beside pay-per-click now, like paper call, for example. Um, So that's one of them. Like it's very odd that you have one person that's making a lot of the decisions. So you got to work with a lot of different teams and, you've really got to make sure that you're not siloed. Um, and that's a big part of these reorganizations that you're seeing is kind of breaking down those old silos. And there's still a lot of people that kind of are kind of stuck in their silos and not really working, which with the rest of the organization or sharing credit or doing the things that they need to get done. And I think that's kind of what these companies are trying to get rid of. So are there other digital departments that are siloed or are you referring to more traditional marketing departments? Yeah. Um, just traditional marketing is kind of the way it was. I mean, if you think of the way people marketed 
before it was much more product based, right? And a little less brand. I mean, I think if you saw the Moz survey that came out like for SEOs a few months ago, like the number three concern for SEOs was branding, mm. right? In the old days, you know, if you were just part of a product, you didn't really worry about the brand marketing as a whole. But as the marketing teams get smaller and less product focused, I think you're seeing digital marketing teams um, along with corporate affairs teams that are really, really worried about, you know, marketing the brand as a whole. Yeah, well, I mean that's the thing that I enjoy about SEO now because, um, as I've said before on, on, on um, digital marketing radio, you know, I have been involved in SEO for quite a while, and when I started um, being involved with it, um, it was very easy to register a domain with um, a very generic description of of what that website did and it was easier to rank a website that had a generic domain that probably had a, a branded domain. But now, of course, Google is more about building up the authority and relevance um, of of that brand over time and it makes it um, better to actually focus on SEO as part of um, a decent business rather than actually um, something that that you would do that wasn't coherent with other marketing activities so uh, I'm not sure if you're finding the same experience yourself. Yeah, well, actually, in some markets, especially when I do small businesses like that still works like you can register a really good, um, you know, keyword rich domain name and do on page optimization and depending on how good your competitors are which a lot of times for small businesses they're not that good that's all you need to win but you're right in large organizations that's happening and i know this is probably something that a lot of seos don't want to hear but i really think penguin and panda were the best things that ever happened to seo because before you could kind of game the system and you could do different things and you didn't really have to think about things about content strategy or user experience um but now you have to think about everything possible like when seo the entire website experience and i think it's really helped seos and seos in a lot of ways are really the most well positioned people to kind of roll up into the higher digital marketing roles because you have to consider you know things like conversion rates time on site you know are they clicking this button are they clicking that button like what's the like what's the server set up for example you know, there's just mm. so much you have to consider now as an SEO. It's really made us be much more well-rounded professionals and it's kind of got rid of the riffraff. <laughs> so um, if someone was working as an SEO within an organization or perhaps even just with in a digital marketing department and um, they were struggling to justify um, why they wanted budget to do whatever they were doing, um, what are a few of the things that you can advise them to say to senior mark marketing management um, to actually justify getting getting budget to do um, SEO activity? Yeah, so the first thing, and I think this is for all of marketers, no matter where you are at what thing, is you have to justify the need before you justify, you can even talk about the project. So really get built in for whatever the need is. So, you know, say for example, that your SEO is really, really bad in a small percentage of your traffic or, you know, you're not doing as much paid search as you should be. Um, you know, you kind of start looking at your competitors and you can use great tools like similar web or, um, spy Fu, I think it's good. SEM rush is one we use a lot and you can show, well, our competitors and you're making estimates, but estimates is all you have are getting this much traffic and we're only getting this much traffic. So you got to kind of build the need first and show that okay. there's an actual need. And then once you've got buy-in on the need, and you do need to have a solution at the time you're selling the need. But once you get the buy-in on the need, then you can say, okay, let's like, here's the solution and let's go for it. And the other thing I would say that's really, really important is start small. So, you know, if you're asked, if you're new to an organization or you don't have a lot of experience with your manager, say you just went through one of these reorgs that these large corporations are going through all the time. Um, and they don't have much trust in you yet because they just haven't worked with you yet. Start very, very small. Um, build these little wins along the way. And you've got to be really good at telling your story as you win. So if you get a 5% increase in traffic because of the really small change you made, say to meta descriptions, like for an e-commerce site or something like that, you need to tell that story. And then two, I mean, we hear the term rock star in marketing all the, all the time. And if you really want to be a mark a rock star you have to improve other people's lives as well right that's why we love rock stars is because they improve our lives through yeah. music 
So you want to share those wins with the other people that are working on it. So it's not just the SEO team or the paid media team that wanted it. It's the content team. It's the sales people that are actually talking. Like never push it as just your win. Push it as a whole win. Because really, if you think about SEO and everything that Google considers now, there's not a person in your organization that's not doing SEO today. I mean, they're not focused on it the way yeah. you are. But even the customer service representative that's you know solving a problem so you don't get a bad review online is doing SEO. Or they don't they really? realize they're impacting SEO, but of course they are. And um, um, it's it's so important to actually try and embed SEO or activities that are good for SEO within an, um, every public facing area within the business, you know, and it's um, it's challenging, but but hopefully it's moving in the right direction. So, so a couple of great tips you, you had there, certainly start um, slow, just focus on a few different areas because it's easy as an SEO to start in an organization and um, want to change the world, you know, and think, you know, I know, you know, all this is wrong about the site and uh, I'd like yeah. to change this overnight. But um, if you can, uh, as you suggest, maybe target maybe um, a, a dozen pages that were perhaps ranked ranking maybe five to nine um, for reasonable keyword phrases and perhaps a little bit of um, adjustment to the title and meta description and um, perhaps heading on a little bit of extra content on the page could perhaps just by itself impact the rankings. Then you can maybe get more future budget for SEO by doing that, of course. Yeah, so, so every small win builds upon itself, right? And you just, you can't, if you swing for the fences every time you're going to strike out, sorry. It's a baseball analogy, which is probably more popular where I am in the US than where you are. I, I I understand the analogy, although I, I I don't think I've picked up a a bat before. I've seen one bit baseball game before, but uh, <laughs> probably not as many as yourself. And um, then the other um, great tip was make other people look good as well, uh, because it's so easy, you know, in a massive organization, just to feel you've got to just demonstrate that, that you're doing a good job and trying to make yourself look good but if you make other people look good then eventually um you're going to be better um perceived yourself individually and i, I guess that's a, a management tip as well as a, a digital marketing tip yeah and that's really one of the huge things when it comes to breaking those silos because in order to break them down it's all about trust right and if yep. you share your successes with other people and you know include them and say hey they were a big part of this even if it's all the way down um, and I say all the way down to customer service and like, it sounds, um, kind of rude, which isn't mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Cause customer service, I think are unsung heroes, but you know, even down to the customer service level, um, you, it helps break down those silos and just work together and get things done. So customer service can give you many FEQ keyword phrases that you haven't hadn't even thought of. Yeah. And sales as well, like customer service and sales knows what your customer is asking more than anyone. So you really need to be talking to those two people as much as possible. Now that's easier said than done in large corporations, of Absolutely. course, but like the closer somebody is to your customer, the better friends you want to be with them. <laughs> so, so having a look at Pearson.com, it doesn't seem to really focus on selling that much. Um, obviously, you know, you've got about 40,000 staff that, that, that work for you. So you must have loads of other websites under the umbrella. Do you know how many websites you have? Yeah, it's quite a few. I mean, a, a ridiculous amount. And that's kind of one of the big things that we're trying to fix. So, I mean, the numbers are all over the place, but it's definitely hundreds and um, maybe even thousands of actual websites. And that comes out of the organizations we've been in. Like, and traditionally, we can't, like Pearson was a publisher, like Penguin Books, um, you know, and all sorts of things like DK. Um, during Ken Kendersley is one of our brands as well. Um, and publishers have always had like a lot of brands. Um, and then we have a lot of products as well. So kind of going back to where we talked about the old days and like whenever it was product focused and that's the way people much more did marketing, like every product kind of owned their own web strategy and decided what they did on the web. And a lot of times they were, you know, deciding their own websites and like one product every time they had a new release, for example, might come out with a new web site or a subdomain, which people don't realize, but a subdomain, like 
is almost as bad as adding a new website because it splits your it splits your authority you know even further like it's not the same as putting it on your www or whatever your main website is so that's actually a huge area of concern for us and that's actually kind of my biggest project that i'm trying to work on and get by in and now it's just the fact we need to reduce the number of websites we have have a stronger brand online actually look like a giant multinational corporation um and you know like have the power because i think online and a lot of corporations like that when you do have all those websites you don't look like like google or apple where they look like they dominate their industry you actually look like a bunch of small to medium sized loosely connected businesses yeah, absolutely like, uh, online and you know like even if like the way you guys market yourself there's digitalmarketingradio.com there's the 26 week plan i think you got another one about this week in organic like the business book like yes that's another 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 show <laughs> i do absolutely yes it's um you kind of need to split separate brands but you need to be careful to actually keep as much authority to the one domain at the same time as well um yeah and it's really topical based right or the way they use it so so if someone's using your customer service website completely different than they would use um you know, say you just get information about your products, like those can be two different sites, but like, say, you know, you have a site about, like, I'll just use our examples in education. Like we, you know, there's two different big areas in the U S and I think pretty much everywhere. I think in the UK, you'll call them primary and secondary. And in the U S we call it K-12 and higher education. Okay like those are kind of the same topic right and if the business is big enough yes you can separate those but don't just separate two topics related to the same thing yeah. so if it, they're both related to education like just because they're two different topics within education it should still re be really one site now if the business is extremely complex and doing you know thousands of things um, which is our case then it's okay to do it but don't just make decisions to separate a website because one topic's a little different like it's really about the user experience because you know today in seo like having a website about 10 related topics is much better than just having a website about one topic and one topic only so yeah. I well, one other thing you, you touched on, actually, you, you mentioned that um, you do a lot of focus on brand. So do you actually do brand SEO? Uh, and if so, how, how do you actually measure the ROI of, of brand SEO or brand marketing? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, all your ROI really needs to be about what people care about, right? And I think as SEOs, we have a really bad habit of just pushing stats on people and sometimes it's because the only stats we have like rankings for example like rankings are great to monitor and we should definitely be monitoring them or the number of inbound links those are things you should definitely monitor but if you put that on a ceo's desk or a hmm. scfo's desk and say i improved traffic by 10 percent, or you know i increased our links from 10,000 to 25,000 or something or along those lines, they don't care. Like they want to know revenue. They want to know leads, like, you know, like they're not interested in those kind of stats. So that's really kind of the language that you need to learn to talk as well. Like, you know, find out what's important to your managers and your decision makers and talk in those languages. Cause I could say that we had a thousand rankings last month and two thousand rankings this month, but I'm not really going to impress anyone outside of SEO or digital marketing with that. And so do you find it tougher to justify activities that end up with a longer term win? You know, certainly generic SEO isn't as likely to bring in a customer straight away, um, yeah. but perhaps it's, it's actually better value for money. But obviously, if it's perhaps not going to bring in a customer until six, nine months or so, then is it difficult for you to justify that act activity to your superiors? Yeah, it is. And like, I think everyone has that challenge that does anything. And at most B2B marketers are there. And I think most of what we do is B2B or B2G. And we do have a little um, business to co consumer business, but we do a lot of B2G. So anytime you have a large... So, so sort of what's, what's B2G? No, but business to government. Sorry. A government, right. Okay, got you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anytime you have a long cycle like that, that's always the problem, right? The marketing attribution and the model you're going to use in the funnel. I mean, I think tools like Salesforce and like having the marketing cloud and the sales cloud together can really help that. And that's something we're trying to implement 
Um, and I think a lot of companies are, but it's always going to be the case. But I will say one thing that I kind of evolved over in the last year where I was much more worried, I'd say a year or two ago about like which channel led to which conversion is it's really not that case. Like there's you, there's very seldom one channel leading to a conversion. So if you're thinking that way, it's kind of an outdated way of thinking. Like usually when you see a customer and if you can follow those, their path over time or, um, there's almost always multiple channels. Like they saw, they came to the website through organic. Usually it's kind of the first touch channel. And then, you know, they came back a few weeks or they clicked a PPC ad and then they signed up for social and then they're social. Like, so when you got that long sales cycle, especially you're going to have five, 10 touch points in there and no two customers are going to take the same path. So it's really about using all the channels, like in every channel you do need to be using. Um, and then kind of deciding, okay, how much do I spend in this channel? But it's not like saying email is better than social and social is better than SEO, because if you're thinking that way, it's outdated. Like, So, so how, how do you allocate um, the value um, of each step in the process? Do you actually give more to the, the first touch and the last touch? Or do you allocate based on the length of time someone's been on your site, uh, based upon where they've come from and a particular path? Well, I think no matter what you're doing, you should have a baseline of spend in every area right so yeah. now when you're allocating it really depends on what you're doing so for example i do seo and ppc like those are two areas that's under me and ppc you definitely focus on last channel right because usually like those are the people who are click buy um so that's something that you can really see a lot in ppc and seo there's not a lot of search by if that makes sense um so like it really kind of depends on what you're selling. So if you're selling something where the buy thing is in a day, like I definitely focus on last touch, but if it's something where it's over a long time, then it kind of comes to uh, like that. I actually like the model where it gives equal value to everything except, or the U shape model where the first and last touch get the most value. And then, you know, anything in the middle, you give a little less value, but I mean, my kind of point in talking about how every touch is on, the longer your sell cycle is, like the least you should be worried about which touch gets the attribute and the more you should be worried about touching your customer in as many different places as possible. Got you. Yeah. And um, also what you're saying, I think, was, you know, if you can define your average length of sales cycle and perhaps focus a little bit more of your budget on the activity that is more likely to drive traffic at yeah. that initial stage in the process. Yeah, I think you probably said it better than I was. I was floundering a little bit, but yeah, like it, on a longer sales cycle, you can definitely focus on different things that actually work better, like paid search for shorter sales cycles work better. But the longer your sales cycle is, the more you kind of need to be using different channels or touching everything, which you should always use all channels, but you might focus more on paid search on something that has a one day sales cycle than something that has a, you know, a three month sales cycle or just change the way you do search. So for yeah. example, if it's something you know, like a retail product where somebody's going to see the ad, click it and buy within 15 minutes. Um, you definitely want to spend a lot of money on paid search and that's how you're doing your PPC. But if it's the opposite where you have a very long six to nine month or even longer sales cycle, then you may actually want to spend more money on those brand activities where you're bringing people in over time and then remarketing them. And when I say remarketing, you never want to take them back to the same page, mm. but you want to show them all the other things that you're, company does as well because like in a long sales cycle like they're not only cons considering your company they're considering multiple other companies so you kind of want to build that you know this is how else we're awesome instead of just keep taking them back to the same product page which i mean if you've ever visited an amazon page you know how that stocks you for like two or three weeks you know <laughs> which for what amazon does that works but if amazon was a service that it took us nine months to actually buy from then you would get very sick of seeing that same product page over that entire nine month period and a better strategy for them at that point would be like maybe talk about the nonprofit that they support so you kind of build that trust and see all the other cool things they're doing or some other products that are related to so if if you did have a nine month um sales cycle and you were retargeting for that nine month period how often should you actually change your creative well, I see definitely after about three months, you see quite a bit of um, fatigue and you start um, 
you know, people stop clicking on the same ad after about three months. So you should definitely be changing kind of your ad creative or at least what they're saying, at least every three months. We actually usually don't do it that way. Like, I mean, we do change our creative so long, but like usually if you get put into a certain section of our site, then instead of just getting one remarketing ad, you kind of get multiple remarketing ads to what the subsections of that topic might be so you kind of see all the other different things that we do in your area as well and then you know say if we have something like a scholarship program or anything like that then we might talk about that or uh, you know something corporate affairs is doing like a literacy project you know talk about all the different kind of things your your company does great okay well let's segue into the second section of our discussion so that focuses more on your thoughts on where digital marketing's been and where it's heading so starting off with software i couldn't live without so what software do you currently use in your business that if someone took away from you it would significantly impact your marketing success well i don't think this is kind of the answer you're looking for because it's not what we would consider a digital marketing software but i do think it's the best software ever created and that's excel I mean, okay. Like just all you guys the, would say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just all the things you can do um, in Excel and all the different data that you can, and like really, I mean, it's almost unlimited the things you can really do if you really learn it and all the different things it has. So I think Excel is kind of uh, the big one. Now, it to just to give you a digital marketing software that I really like, and that's Moz. And you know, everyone in the SEO industry knows Moz. And the thing I like about Moz is just the value for what it does. Like, it might not be the best, like keyword research or rank tracker or um, all the different things that it does, but it for ninety nine dollars you can get all those tools. You know, that can help you look at your link profile. Can you can set up rank trackers? You know, you get all that great stuff that they actually kind of teach you um so just value and you know Rand certainly does a good job just just teaching and just offering so much value even in his whiteboard fridays yeah and then even the analytics tools that they have now too where it can kind of help you understand your analytics better and make decisions off that are really really good as well Okay, here's a slightly more challenging question, and that's what piece of software don't you use, but you've heard good things about and you intend to try at some point in the near future? Well, I think like this is one of them and like Blab and just all the live streaming things that they have now. Like I haven't used Blab at all. I haven't used um, Meerkat and Periscope. And I think those really kind of help, especially when you're trying to build that trust with your customer, whoever that customer is. And obviously as a digital marketer, you might not be the one talking to them because you're not the subject matter expert, but just, you know, if you have a subject matter expert about your product, like I can see a huge power of putting them in front of a live scope or a meerkat or a periscope or a meerkat for a few minutes and just letting people like um, ask them questions. Cause you know, uh, nothing builds trust like seeing you face to face. Absolutely. Like, I mean, you answer those questions. And nothing builds conversion rates like trust as well. Yeah. So if people trust you and um, you're in a very, very competitive niche, then uh, you want those conversion rates to be as good as possible so that um, you, know, you can afford to compete in those uh, the highly costly markets, of course. Yeah, yeah it's an um, interesting place to be at the moment. Um, but let's move on to... I wish I would have. I'd like you to look back in the very first day that you're involved in trying to market a business online. What didn't you do so well? What do you wish that you would have done differently? Well, like I actually kind of got into marketing, like in college, they forced me to take a web design class. <laughs> right. So I was actually uh, doing broadcasting and electronic media. So like TV production and stuff like that. And so like I taught myself web design and realized how easy it was and it wasn't the magic I thought it was. And like, this is actually something I could do. So, was this like, using Dreamweaver or something yeah, else at the time? Yeah. 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 So like I started designing websites and actually the first few websites I designed were actually um, like I, I've made them like using the different Adobe tools. It wasn't Photoshop. I think they had a different one named Fireworks. And then I spliced it. Yeah. And then like put it back together with HTML, like, you know, to make it do different things. So my entire first, say, three or four websites that I just did for small churches, it's charity, but they were all image based text. And, you know, that's really, really, really horrible. So I think that that first, I don't know, say three months that I was doing digital marketing, I was making a huge mistake and never even 
realize oh, it's, it's good to self teach yeah. because then you you learn everything that goes behind things when i built my f first websites using tables i created corners using curved circles and like tr transparent backgrounds instead of um css it was um but it was i think it was before css even existed to be honest with you yeah. oh great experience um but um uh, Bringing you back to the present, you know, what, what marketing activity would you say is is something that you're most passionate about at the moment, something that's really working really well for you at the moment? So the thing that's working the best and it's really kind of related to brand building for us at the moment is remarketing. And when we first started remarketing, we were actually doing it pretty poorly, um, like we were spending way too much, about almost sometimes like eight dollars per click um which is way way too high but we've kind of tested a few different tools and we've actually kind of figured like the best way to do it is actually to do it through google analytics and adwords together okay. um but in adwords the, the key is don't bid cpm because if you bid cpm you're not going to even do better than what we were doing like eight dollars per click bid cpc like okay. in adwords because that actually brings it way down almost to the same cost as display so you're doing directly with Google. You're not using AdRoll or Perfect Audience or anything like that. No, we tried a few of them, and you know, I'm not going to say which ones we tried, um, but it, definitely tried both of them. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we tr we tried one of the ones you mentioned. Let's just say that, um, and we didn't have a lot of luck, and that could have been user error. But since we've switched it and we're doing like through Google Analytics, so we build our audiences in Google Analytics, we connect them to AdWords. And then in AdWords, we actually bid CPC on our audiences instead of CPM. And you can change that in your settings. Um, like we've reduced our costs like 90, 95%. Wow. Um, so and have you tried Facebook as well or are you just doing it Google at the moment? Um, so like going back to being a big organization and having different teams, um, there is a team that like handles social media. And obviously you can't do social media without paid. So we've kind of tested Facebook and looked at their advertising, but we haven't hmm. done a ton of it. So unfortunately I can't make a great direct comparison, but it does seem like a really good channel just from what we've tested. Um, and it's kind of in that middle of the cost range where it's not too expensive. Like, you know, some of the other things you can usually get most clicks in the 50 cents to a dollar range. And we've actually seen on certain things like webinar, um, things like social media actually really lead to a lot of, um, signups, which I think is kind of almost the same thing as like when we were talking about remarketing earlier, where you're showing them the different things that you do. I think mm. social media is also really great for that. So once they sign up for social, they may only know about one of your products or one of your areas, especially if you're a large corporation that does a lot of things. But through social, you can show them all the great blog posts you're writing, you know, the different learner um, success stories or customer success stories you might have and like, you know, the different types of content marketing where it's a PDF or a white paper or a webinar. And I think it's really good for doing that, whether you're doing it organic or paid. Okay, well, I mean, it's certainly uh, intriguing that um, doing it directly with Google and focusing on per click is is what's performed for you best. So I'm, I'm sure that um, tip will be very much worthwhile for many of our listeners. So yeah, thanks for that. But let's move on to the this or that round. So this is the quick response round. Ten quick questions, just two rows here. Try not to think about the answer too much. And you're only allowed to say the word both on one occasion. Ready to go? Yeah. <whistles> Email or Twitter? Email. Audio or video? Video. Affiliates or display advertising? Affiliate. Facebook or Google Plus? Facebook. Online press releases or one and one relations? One and one relations. Paid search or SEO? That's definitely my both. Email contact form or telephone number? Email contact form. Website or app? Website. Social subscriber or email subscriber? Email subscriber. And local marketing or global marketing? Local. Uh, there are two that intrigued me there. Um, the first of all, the affiliates. You probably had to think a long time about that as well. But um, do, do you do much affiliates yourself? Um, no, we do have a, a kind of a business unit that does a lot of it. The reason I <laughs> kind of was wondering, like, what I should say is, it kind of depends on what you're doing. So if you have something that's e-commerce, for example, and we do have a few e-commerce sites, um, like I would choose affiliate. You know, but if you're doing something like 
you know, what we were talking about earlier, like a long-term site where you have a long sales cycle, then I would definitely go for branding. So it was kind of, I was could, thinking, could be either, yeah. yeah, depending on what you're marketing. And the other one that jumped out was um, you said local marketing rather than global marketing very quickly. And considering you work for a massive company, <laughs> local marketing seemed quite an interesting choice. Yeah. Well, one local is different for everyone, right? So like some of the small businesses, when they say local, they might be talking about a one city, right? And like, even though like in a normal day, like I work to build a really big brand, like say you're in a small town in like the UK, like, and you're only one of three plumbers, like it's very easy for you to build your brand within your local geography. But like for you, that local geography is your global geography because you don't care what somebody in London or Exeter like is searching or doing. So when I say local, it's always about focusing on where your customers are at the most. So as you build audiences, like can really, if you're doing remarketing or programmatic or anything like that, you're, that's, you're really locally marketing to like your best audience, even though your best audience might be all over the world. So I may have created my own definition of local when I answered that. <laughs> Cut you. The $10,000 question. So if I was to give you $10,000 and you had to spend it over the next few days on a single thing to grow your business, what would you spend it on and how would you measure success? So just trying to think of $10,000. I think the best thing to do would be to take whatever your best product is and really set up a good sales funnel um, for that and then just throw paid search at it so for example if you have one really really good product um you know you create that sales funnel so people click on this page and i would actually even hire a professional do it because there's some great professionals that really just focus on building um, squeeze pages or bounce pages um take your best products have them build that funnel for you um or a page that's highly likely to convert it and then throw the rest at paid search specifically and when you say paid search, do you just mean Google AdWords or could you mean something else as well? Well, um, if that's a product that they can click and buy that day, yes. Just do Google AdWords or any paid search where you're actually bidding on keywords, like being good with Yahoo or fine as long as you're bidding on specific keywords. Now, if it's something over time, like if it's a long sales cycle, like we were talking about earlier, I, I would change the paid search to things like display and remarketing because you're not going to get a ton of uh, sales, at least you're never even going to know if you got sales on a six to nine month, um, you know, uh, so, by process. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got you. My number one takeaway. Well, Jared, you've offered a lot of great advice in our conversation, but what's the number one takeaway? What's the single most important step that our listeners need to take away and implement in their businesses? Well, I think, and this is something that kind of really changed like the way I do marketing, but you need to focus most of your time on doing things that scale. Like for example, like if me and you were just having this conversation on the phone, then you know you can take it and put it on your website. I think you've written a book, right? A book scales because you can actually put this book in tons of stores now and sell it all over the place. So if I had to say one thing that I think really is gonna define your success in the digital marketing world, because the digital marketing world is all about taking an idea or a product and scaling it, is do that with your time as well. Only spend, or at least spend the vast majority of your time doing things that are gonna scale. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great, great, great advice there. And um, probably a deep thought for people to go, go away and think about, you know, because it's um, so easy to think that you're focusing on the right thing. And um, maybe you're doing the right thing for the short term, but it's perhaps something that won't scale. So um, try and work on something that scales. Yeah. And it really, when you think about scale, I mean, it can be very, very small, like, you know, something like writing a blog post, right? Because now you have that blog post in perpetuity. And mm. you can do all sorts of things with it, right? It can get organic search. You can, you can set up paid search, you know, doing a small video. Like, so really the term scale today um, can basically mean a ton of things, but anything that basically lives forever and you can continue to market or, you know, use for the rest of your life or at least a long time. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, excellent. Okay. That, that takes us to the end of our discussion today. So thank you so much for your time and your advice. What's the best way for our audience to find out more about you and wh what you do? Um, well, like <laughs> I don't do a lot of brand building or anything like that, but if you did had any questions or you wanted to ask me more, I guess you could reach out to me on Twitter it would probably be the easiest way. So it's just at Jarrett Byram, which is 
my first last name. Great stuff. Okay, well, we'll certainly include a link to that in the show notes at digitalmarketingradio.com. So, thanks to uh, Jarrett, and thank you, dear listener, for listening to. If you enjoyed what Jarrett shared today, here's how you can help. Go to your friend's iPhone, go to the podcast app, and search for Digital Marketing Radio. Then click on the show and hit the subscribe button and make them listen too. Finally, I'm also hosting another live show every Friday called This Week in Organic. Head over to thisweekinorganic.com to find out more about that. But that's all for now. Until we meet again, adios. And thank you for joining me, Jared. It was really great. Thank you for having me.